Good evening and welcome to the special Vote 2014 edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Tonight's show is a debate. We will hear from candidates competing in the Republican primary for Congressional District 9. As with all of Arizona Horizon's debates, this is not a formal exercise. It's an open exchange of ideas, an opportunity for a give and take between candidates for one of the state's most important offices. As such, interjections, even interruptions, are allowed, provided that all sides get a fair shake, and we will do our best to see that that happens. Congressional District 9 is Arizona's newest district. It was created after the 2010 census and covers much of the East Valley along with areas of Central and North Central Phoenix. Two Republicans are running in a GOP primary for CD9. They are, in alphabetical order, former Air Force pilot and businesswoman Wendy Rogers and former ASU and NFL quarterback Andrew Walter. Each candidate will have one minute for opening and closing statements. Earlier, we drew numbers to see who goes first, and that honor goes to Wendy Rogers. I'm Wendy Rogers, a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, one of the first 100 women pilots in the Air Force, a mom, a grandma, a small business owner with my husband. We meet a payroll. I'm running for Congress because something is wrong in this country. Washington is broken and that has affected us here in Arizona. We have a porous border. We have a rampant immigrant problem. The Phoenix VA hospital has failed our veterans. There's a clear choice here. You can vote for me, someone who has served her country honorably, or you can vote for my opponent, a man who refuses to admit that this is a problem here in our country and we have a border problem where we will have to address it. This requires leadership. It requires conviction and backbone. I will be that woman for you in Congress. All right. Thank you very much. And now Andrew Walter with his opening remarks. Thank you, Ted. Many may remember that I played quarterback and captain the football team at ASU. I also played in the NFL. When I left, I went back to ASU, turned an MBA, started a lending business, and my wife, Inning, and I, we just celebrated our first year of marriage. This town has been so good to me, and that's why I'm running, to give back. I'm running because I believe we've reached a unique point in American history. I believe the challenges that we face are generational in nature. You know, when I think back to my playing days, I could sum it all up in one word, accountability, wins, losses, Touchdowns, interceptions. I never made excuses for my performance. I was always accountable for my actions. I'll do the same in Congress. My opponent has spent tens of thousands of dollars viciously attacking me personally, my past, and she's being very dishonest about her positions on Social Security. I find that to be troubling because that's not accountability, that's not leadership. Okay, we'll stop it right there. Let's get things going here. Wendy, we'll start with you. Uh, you ran a couple of years ago. Voters said no. You're running again. Why? I want to serve my country. I'm not a quitter. I narrowly lost the Republican primary last time with seven Republicans in the primary by only 700 votes. Washington is broken. This has affected us here at home with the VA, with the border. What is required? is a call to service on my part. I will go to Washington with backbone, with leadership, with business success experience. We have been working very hard for two years. We are one of the top 10 campaigns in the country. I will win this primary. Andrew, conversely, you are a first time candidate and the first office <coughs> you're running for is United States Congress. Why? Because I think so many of these decisions nowadays are made in Washington. I find that to be unfortunate. You know, federalism and states' rights and individual sovereignty are there for a reason. And uh, the reason why I decided to run for this office is because I think we have a massive leadership deficit now more than ever in Washington. You know, elections aren't about candidates. They're not about us. It's about the people. And the moment that we forget that, I think that is the first step towards becoming out of touch. That's not me. That's not my history. And so now more than ever, when we have somebody in office who's advocated for a VA-style single-payer health care system, that would be Congresswoman Cinema. And that's not my description. That's actually uh, Paul Krugman of the New York Times. If we've learned anything, it's that that system, not the medical professionals, but that system treats people like units, cogs, 
Well, we're not units or cogs, we're human beings, and we need change. You mentioned in your opening statement that your opponent did not seem, I, I got the impression you said he did not seem as, as, uh, as concerned about immigration. Well, what were you saying there? The Arizona Republic has said that my opponent is clueless on the border. You have not ruled out amnesty. You did not understand what the Gang of Eight... Okay, well, let me jump in here right by. now. Stand by, I'm not... So, let, 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 let her at least get through the first half of the stuff. <laughs> Go ahead, please. We don't have time for on-the-job training. We don't have time to send someone to Congress who has not led, who has not served this country. I've been a leader, actually. I've been a team captain for three years. The only player in Arizona State history that actually has that distinction. But let me say this. Matt Salmon has proposed a bill co-sponsored by every single member of our delegation that deals with immigration. So let me say on the record, uh, in case you missed it, that I am categorically opposed to amnesty. Moreover, I take that next step and talk about specifics, something that I wish you did more of with regard to amnesty and, and immigration. I have supported Matt Salmon's bill, H.R. 5053, which essentially reforms the William Wilberforce Act, and it allows um, it allows the United States federal government to reunite these minors with their parents or guardians in their country of origin. So actually, I've gone the next step, something that you haven't done. So okay, you so are for reuniting these children with whom? With their parents or guardians in their country of origin. That is a very important distinction. Okay, I'm saying in their so country of origin. And is I that am in the categorically United opposed to amnesty. No, that is not in the United okay, States. Be that specific. Is, well, actually, I have been because unlike you, I've taken a position on Matt Salmon's bill. What, what is your position on that bill? Just curious. Do you know it? I know what my four positions are. My so you four. don't know the Matt Salmon bill? May that, I, that has been co-sponsored by every I, single member I, of the delegation? Please, please okay. give us your positions here. Absolutely. We must secure the border. Can we secure the border? Will you secure the border if you go to Congress? How will you do that physically? How will you acquire the political will? Well, if you're how will, me a question, how will you work with other people to secure the border? Secondly, how are we going to handle these children that have come through? They need to be returned, as you say, to their country. How are you going to expedite that? How are you going to enforce the rule of law? By supporting we have Matt to, Salmon's bill. We have to enforce the rule of law. We have to secure the border. That's why I'm categorically opposed to amnesty. The uh, 2008 human trafficking law, should that be amended? Well, like I said, Matt Salmon's bill, which deals with the William Wilberforce um, Act, which essentially deals with what you're talking about, um, it expands the scope to include countries from Central America. So that is an amendment essentially to that bill. And that's why I've been very outspoken and very detailed about my support of that. But, but the, the, the 2008 human trafficking bill, the, the, the aspect that most folks talk about when they talk about amending is streamlining the process and getting those children out of the country quicker or as soon as possible. Do you agree with that? Well, I think what we have right now is what we have learned is that chaos and anarchy, that is not compassionate. I read a, a, an article the other day where a human smuggler said business is booming. We should weep when we say things like that, no, this amendment to the William Wilberforce Act would actually uh, treat these children with the compassion that they deserve. And I, look, I don't have kids, but I can't imagine what it would be like to be separated from my children. That's not compassion. What we have now is anarchy. Do the, uh, again, the 2008, uh, call it what you will, this, this particular act, should it be amended to streamline, deport, get these children out of the country as quickly as possible? We should enforce the rule of law, yes. We should send children back to the families where they came from. If we are a nation of laws, as we are, we have to enforce the rule of law. But right now the rule of law says that these kids need hearings and those hearings can sometimes drag on for a lot of time. What people are saying regarding a variety of methods is streamline it, make it quicker. You agree? Yes. And what happens to these children? when they, Does it matter where they go, how you deport them? Talk to us about the logistics of something like this. Well, let's talk about how they came here to begin with. We have a commander in chief who has made it very clear to Central American countries that we are open for children to come here and that they can come here and come through our border with no repercussions. We have to enforce the rule of law as it stands today. Otherwise, we will be beyond where we should be. Should the uh, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, should that program be defunded? Well, let me just say specifically with regard to uh, 
overall uh, immigration, because I think sometimes we get into the weeds. This is not just an issue for me. This is real life. I'm married to an immigrant. Her parents came here legally from Taiwan. That was a very long process. It took 15 years to get their legal status. Why is that? My father-in-law has his master's degree. Should that be the case? Look, the point is, this is not a political football for me. I try to be very specific about how we can actually expedite this, this, this situation that we have going on right now. But I want people to know, for me, this is something that I know very intimately, and I'm going to treat it as such. Specifically, childhood arrivals, uh, dreamers, in other words, should that, first of all, the deferred action plan, should it either be defunded? Basically, what I'm asking is, should these dreamers be immediately deported? Well, like I said, I'm categorically opposed to amnesty. So uh, I know the president has uh, taken executive action to essentially take the deferred action, which you're talking about, to allow the dreamers to be here in the United States. I oppose amnesty. The first thing that we have to do is secure the border and then take a step-by-step -step approach. That's the responsible thing to do. And that's a very difficult thing in and of itself. Securing the border has many different components. So I'm not prepared to have that discussion until we can actually do something right. How often does government ever do one thing right? That's why we need to focus like a laser. Dreamers, do they need to be immediately deported? What do you think of DACA, the Deferred Action Program? We need to enforce the rule of law and we need to secure the border also. Well, I agree. Right now they are here in the country by executive order. It, it, again, that seems to be the, the pattern now. Do you agree with that? I do not. So you would immediately deport these folks that were born here. We need to enforce born, the rule of law, whatever that looks like. Born elsewhere, raised here, they're called dreamers, but you say uh, if, if the law says what, immediately deport. What does deport, that say, Ted? If we have an executive action that allows people who weren't supposed to be here to remain here, what does that say? Where, where do we draw the line? Are we not a nation of laws? Where, are we going to selectively enforce the law here and not there? We have to be consistent. She said immediately deport them. I didn't get a straight answer from you. Do you think they should be immediately deported? Well, I think we should enforce the rule of law, but I also think that the first step has to be securing the border. We have to recognize 40% of the people that are here illegally came here legally and overstayed their visas. My point is very simple. This is an incredibly complex issue, and uh, that's why we need a step-by-step -step approach to solve it. Um, as far as uh, securing the border, define it. What does it mean? How do we know it's secure and we can move on? Many different components. So one part, uh, physical, that has to do with fencing, that has to do with electronic surveillance. Another part, human, that has to do with boots on the ground. Um, and then there's the, uh, the, like I said earlier, 40% of the people that came here uh, legally and overstayed visas. That's a very complex component. It has nothing, it, it, it's not just, I should say, not just the southern border. Everybody gets focused on our border to Mexico, and rightfully so, because we are a border state. But this is very, very complex. So from my standpoint, I think it's all of the above. Let's make it simple, let's make it clear, and then let's move from there. Okay, as far as a secure border, we keep hearing securing the border. What defines a secure border? Well, no, we have a secure border. How will we when know? children stop coming unaccompanied, when the news in Central America is that they will be turned away and that the rule of law will be enforced, it is absolutely physically capable of being accomplished. And when that word gets out and when families know that if they come to our border, they will not penetrate that border, that's when we know it'll be secure. You're running for Congress. You're running for the House. The upper chamber has already passed an immigration bill. If you were in the House and you were presented with that bill, how would you vote? I want to make sure that it includes securing the border first. So comprehensive immigration so, reform? So basically you're saying if they, if they want a 700 mile border fence, if you want 20,000 border agents added, if you want increased funding for securing the border, is that enough of a start or nothing until your definition of a secure border exists. We must secure the border. So whatever it takes cost-wise, and I know that that is a constant uh, changing target. The point is political will. Unless the House has political will, and then that then passes the Senate, it's a moot point. The only way we can secure the border is to get both houses of Congress to agree to secure the border. It is not a situation of being physically incapable of doing, it is a political will situation. If the Speaker presented the Senate bill to you in the House, how would you vote on it? 
Uh, I'm running for Congress to be a part of the process. Right now, I'm not part of the process. Uh, that's very frustrating to me. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm sitting here. That's why I'm running. So uh, I'm not going to speak to whether or not I would vote for the bill that came over from the Senate. I know there's been 300 bills passed from the House that deal with economic freedom and growing our economy that are now sitting in Harry Reid's desk. Do we have a uh, crisis right now? We do. Does it need to be addressed today? It does. But uh, I'm running in order to be a part of the solution. Uh, okay, let, let's move on here. Uh, should the House initiate impeachment proceedings against the president? Not at this point. Because? It requires high crimes and misdemeanors. I would have to be convinced that that were the case. What do you think? Well, the House has the power of the purse. And so I think that's the appropriate course of action. Look, when we talked about the uh, Affordable Care Act and Obamacare and shutting down the government, my approach would have been very simple. I would have, in order to uh, get change out of uh, Congress, you essentially remove the ability for them to exempt themselves from the very laws that they pass. So I would have removed that ex exemption for members of Congress and their staff. You would have seen change so quickly. So my point in, doing, in, in saying this is that uh, we have the power of the purse in the House. And I think that's the appropriate uh, approach to uh, getting anything done. So not necessarily impeachment proceedings. Correct. Okay. Um, let's talk about uh, the Tea Party. Talk about the Tea Party, your relationship to the, are you a member of the Tea Party? Do you support Tea Party principles? I'm not a member of the Tea Party. The Tea Party is an essential component of the conversation. Uh, the Republican Party, all components, have come on board to support me. I'm a, I'm a Wendy Rogers Republican. And when I say that, I have a special background that no one else has. Having served my country, having been and still am a business owner, a mother, a grandmother. I'm my own person. And what that means is that when I go to Congress, I will find people who are like-minded with me, who share my values of American exceptionalism, of getting government out of the way of small business so that business can create jobs, of, of knowing the value of life. Those are the kinds of values I stand for. If the Tea Party supports those values, then they support me. Tea Party member, Tea Party supporter, what do you think? Well, Tea Party, what does it stand for? Tax enough already. So if what the Tea Party stands for is the fact that we're overtaxed, overregulated, burdened by a, a gross and uh, overreaching federal government, then count me among their numbers. You know, I, I guess this is an area of distinction between myself and Wendy. Apparently, I guess you're not proud to, uh, to be a part of a conservative movement. Uh, I am. I have folks who've endorsed me from the liberty movement, conservatives. I have a broad coalition as well, and I don't run from any of those people. Uh, I embrace folks that want to shrink the size of government and uh, grow our economy, create economic prosperity for millions of Americans. Why don't you? I certainly count myself among the people that want to do that, balance our budget. That's one of the reasons why, again, going back to specifics, I have supported and I'll always support a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution that will tie future Congress's hands. That's a step in the right direction. I also believe in term limits. Last point. The reason why I believe in term limits is because this was never meant to be a profession. I know you've run and lost multiple times since I was playing for the Oakland Raiders. But the point is, this isn't meant to be a career. I'm the only one in this campaign that believes in term limits. Let her respond. I meet a payroll every two weeks. My husband is the last one to take the jobs. We take care of our employees. We've created jobs for 17 years. I know what being overtaxed is. I know what being overregulated is. And I know what trying to conduct business in a litigious environment is like. I know how these three forces squash entrepreneurialism, hurt the market, and what this country is American exceptionalism all about. I know that. I live it every day. And as for having run twice before, I'm not a quitter. And many people, including David Schweikert to Abraham Lincoln, ran multiple times before being elected because it is one thing to run and serve one's country. It's another thing to have a career not work out and then wake up the next morning and decide to run for Congress. Let's get to some of the... Uh, Wait, was that, a, was that a veiled shot at the fact that I'm not playing in the NFL anymore? 
Is that, is that what your point was? I mean, your silence, I guess I'll take that that was exactly what you're talking about. Answer. It's a very competitive I answer. industry. I will answer. Well, I'll just go ahead and take the opportunity since well, I felt you like you were me taking a, question, a shot. May I answer? Okay, <laughs> let, it was, was, I mean, that, was that a shot at the playing days? It was a commentary on the fact that running for Congress is not something that can be capriciously decided in a moment. So you're judging my character now? You know what? Character does matter. Take that as a yes. That's very dangerous. Why haven't, how, well, how, that's a slippery slope. How do you Why? respond? This is personal. This is character. You attacking my character. You, you know are what, Ted? going to I'm Congress glad you brought that up. I, I'm represent. really glad you brought that up because on top of attacking my character, which I think is completely out of bounds, uh, you have also said that I've broken the law. You have. This is something that uh, Wendy sent out that said I flat out broke the law, campaign finance law. That is, in fact, inaccurate, and, and just so that, uh, you know, to, to do you a favor, I have, I have brought with me the uh, actual f directly from the federal government's website that says, here, I'll just slide this to you, sure. that says, I have done no such thing. This is just an example of the type of negative campaign that you okay. have run. Let's, but, Ted, here, I, one last point. I, Very okay. quickly, because she needs to be able to respond. Well, then I need a little bit more than just a quick response, so please. All right, go ahead. Where is your financial disclosure statement for 2014 with the House Ethics I Committee? I filed an extension. Thank you for asking. I didn't see it. <laughs> the deadline it's was filed. May 15th. It's not posted. Indeed. That's why I filed an extension. It's not there. Attention to detail. Ted, this is a very important point, and this is exactly what I wanted to talk about. So attention to detail. Uh, we're going to make news. We're going to make news right now because in the history of Arizona politics, you're going to see for the first time one competitor help out another. Uh, it's come to my attention and the attention of my campaign that you are in violation of federal campaign finance laws. And let me just show you how you need to fix that. Uh, this is something that is just kind of comical. So right here, this is your name. You misspelled your name. It says Wendry Rogers. So that means every piece of literature or hate mail that you send out regarding me or every commercial that you run, that is something that is against federal law. So you know what, again, I am just here to help. I am just here to be a, you know, very magnanimous individual, and so I'm just here to help you. Go ahead. We have put in a correction to the uh, Federal Election Commission several times on the misspelling of Wendy, which is W-E-N-D-Y. Secondly, Mr. Walter has not filed an extension. Simply we called Washington true. yesterday, and they said they did not it's have simply it. simply not true. All right, before we, before we get, to, uh, get out of here, there are a couple of things that each one of you have attacked each other on. I need relatively quick responses here. Why should Republican voters trust your business instincts? Home went into foreclosure, walked away from a mortgage, you got a business degree, you got a career, and at least they had some experience in banking. Why should they trust you after that incident? Absolutely, because uh, the, the, you're not going to be able to vote for a perfect candidate in this election. You know, uh, I'm, the, the beauty of my campaign and what, what I stand for is I'm accountable for all my actions, good and bad, touchdowns, interceptions. Uh, I don't make excuses for them. I am accountable for them, but just like anybody else, you make a mistake in life, you learn from it, and you move forward. That's exactly what I'm all about. And, you know, in part, I'm glad some of the bad things have happened to me in the past because it's made me the person that I am today. I can relate with that person who's had the moving truck outside of their home. It can never be said about me, oh, you've lived a cush life or something like that. That's actually so far from the truth. You walked away from a mortgage when you could pay but you didn't think anyone was looking and you admitted that you would not have done it had you known you were going to run for Congress. That's why character matters. What else will you do in Congress when no one's looking? Respond, please. Again, uh, she's attacking my character, trying to impugn my judgment. I've already uh, pointed out the fact that you're running a vicious, personal, negative attack that's filled with falsehoods. You know, that's, uh, that's indicative of the type of person. That? That's that you're running that type of campaign? No, no you're running a very vicious campaign. Do you deny that you walked away campaign. from your mortgage when no one was looking? So the fact that, you know, you say that you keep your promises, and I believe that you keep your promises. That's why when you said you would eliminate Social Security, I believe that's exactly what you'll do. And that's troubling to me. Why? Because that affects millions of people, just like my grandparents, as opposed to my let, situation let, affected let's me. Let's get to this. Did you not say in 2012 that you would phase out Social Security? I did not. You what did I not say that? I did not say that. I said Social Security <laughs> is not constitutionally guaranteed was how I answered that question. And what that means is, tomorrow, 
Congress, with the swipe of a pen, could do away with the money in Social Security if it wanted to. That's been upheld by the Supreme Court. And so what is important is to send someone to Congress who will protect Social Security. I have said that publicly many times. So in front of a Tea Party audience, you did not claim that you would phase out Social Security? I did not say that I would phase out Social Security. What I said was Social Security is not constitutionally guaranteed. That's the sense in which I answered that question. Very quickly. Boy, I feel like I should take the rope. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. Look, don't take my word for it. Go to www.therealwendyrogers.com. You can see the video for yourself, my background playing in the NFL in college. The eye in the sky doesn't lie. When you make a mistake or something successful, you see it. Go see the video for okay. yourself and judge for yourself. And we do have to stop it right there. Very interesting. Each candidate will now give a one-minute closing statement and going in reverse order of the opening remarks, we start with Andrew Walter. Thank you for the opportunity to visit with you this evening. Look, I think you can learn a lot about somebody by how they conduct their campaign. From day one, my campaign has been all about the issues, focusing on the issues because that's what matters most. How is the average family in Arizona doing? Is it easier to provide for their, for their kids to put food on the table or is it more difficult? What about the price of college? Is that up or down? Well, what about the price for health care? Actually, today, fewer people have health insurance than before Obamacare was passed into law. Look, we're going in the wrong direction. The oldest definition of insanity is continue to do something the same and expect a different result. Now is the time to send somebody to Washington who has a unique, fresh perspective, who is going to be a fighter and will offer bold vision for the future. But I won't be there forever because I believe in serving my community for a short period of time and coming home. If that's the type of person that you can support, I need your help. All right. Thank you very much. And Wendy Rogers now with her closing remarks. You will receive your ballot in the mail any day now to vote for Congress. I, Wendy Rogers, ask you for that vote. I've been a leader. I've been a business owner. I am a parent and a grandparent. My opponent has refused in many ways to admit his shortfalls in character, in business, in his financial dealings. Character matters. We have had too much corruption in Washington, D.C. What happens in Washington comes to roost here at home. I ask for your vote. I ask you to go to wendyrogers.org. Thank you. All right. Thank you, candidates. And thank you for watching this special Vote 2014 debate featuring the Republican candidates for Congressional District 9. Arizona Horizons debates will now take a break until after the primary election. We'll get going again with general election debates, starting with candidates for Secretary of State. That debate tentatively scheduled for September 10th. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.